We are all loving creations of the Creator God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, a program taking you through the Bible in one year from Revelation to, or Genesis rather, to Revelation 22. Very interesting time. Now, Corey is at home and Corey helps us. What are you doing, Corey? Well, today we are going to be uh, looking to a statement in Proverbs chapter 25. So looking ahead just a little bit. All right, very good. Look forward to that, Corey. She's at home, physically distancing. Well, what are you doing today? Well, today is Focus on Friday. So make sure you've read Proverbs chapter 22. There's going to be a question. Very good. And Ryan, what's up, brother? Well, here's a question for us. What kinds of animals are we allowed to eat according to the Bible? Some passages say none, others say some, and still others say all animals are permitted. So which is it? Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 6. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. I personally believe that one of the most important jobs in the world is becoming a parent. Now, parents have the great responsibility to teach their children about life and to demonstrate the skills needed to move forward in a healthy way. The Bible clearly makes this the most important task any human being could ever have. We must embrace the responsibility for all it's worth, not leaving it to the school system or the youth pastor at the church. More than what we say is how we live and respond to people, how we act and encounter one another that shows our children what we truly think and therefore how they should act because they do follow us. If I was the enemy of a society and my job was to destroy that society, I would first attack the parents and then ultimately destroy the family. Now, this is what exactly Satan has done over the past several years, actually 50 years. In fact, we may learn that we have to come back with wisdom of God today. So may we return to the wisdom of God's word to help us train our children in the way they should go in this world. I find it very important. This subject is something that we need to talk about because it becomes something that is the, the very center of who we are. I know that a lot of folks are uh, focused on what they do and how they get to work and everybody wants to get back to work and all of that. And when I'm taping this program, we're about a month and a week ahead, so we're not back to work in some states or some provinces. But remember that parenting is the key. That's the important factor. And if you're at home with your kids, that's good. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we focus on this because it becomes very important. Take your Bible guide. If you don't have a Bible guide, why not? You could write to us. The bottom of the screen has our address and has our phone number. You can call us as well. And another way to do this is very exciting. You go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, make a donation in any amount. And let me just say thank you so much. For your donations, they keep us strong. They keep us able to come to you every day and to take care of the airtime and everything else. So that keeps us in touch with you. Thank you so much for that. But make a donation and ask for the Bible guide, but it will take you to a place where you can get the PDF files of the Bible guide just as they're printed, but we'll send you one as well. Today, as we talk about this, we're going to be talking about training up a child. Now, what am I talking about, training up a child? I mean, I mean, you know, we've got things in play today. 
But the Bible tells us that we should pay attention, parents. So, Father, I pray today that you would help us to see the truth about parenting and the truth about training up our children in the way that they should go. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, the scripture comes at the end, but let's look first at the other scriptures at the beginning of Psalm, or rather Proverbs 22, verse 1. The Bible says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Now, isn't that fascinating? This, this tells us something very important. We are a loving creation of the almighty God. We should take God's grace seriously. Did you hear me say that? We should take God's grace seriously. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, we should, but they don't really because they're involved in the things they do. Beloved, listen to me carefully. Ladies, listen to me. Gentlemen, listen to me. If we take God's grace seriously, then we understand the grace that God experienced with us. He had to give us grace so that we could be in his presence. So there are many times that we have to give people the grace to exist in our presence. That's just a normal thing if you are a Christian, if you are somebody who follows Jesus Christ. So we must understand that when we take God's grace seriously, we have to pay attention to what that means. Very important. Let's read on because this gets even more interesting. Proverbs 22, verse 3, here's what the Bible says. It says, a prudent man foresees evil and he hides himself, but the simple pass on the way and they are punished. Isn't that interesting? Look at verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life by humility and the fear of the Lord. Humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, three things, and life. Isn't that amazing? You see, beloved, we need to understand that humility and respect are the key ingredients that protect us. Humility and respect. We must always be quick to listen and slow to speak. That's fascinating. Because in today's world of social media, we want to talk, 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 talk. And by the way, talk. AM radio, talk, talk, talk. And by the way, talk. FM radio, talk, talk, talk. And by the way, talk. Digital radio. Everybody wants to talk. But the Bible tells us to be listening, to pay attention, and to spend ourselves paying attention to people so when they talk, there will come a time when we can respond God's way, not our way, not our way. But when we respond, when the Holy Spirit quickens us and we respond the proper way, that becomes very, very critical, especially when we're trying to teach people about who Jesus Christ is. Now, as we continue on, here we go. Watch this. Proverbs 22, 5 and 6. Here it is. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. Interesting, guarding your soul. And here is the verse that we're talking about. All of this sets us up. Verse six, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is older, he will not depart from it. And a lot of people use that and they say, well, I'm going to trade up my child because I want my child to do this. I want my, hold on a minute. It's not about what you want your child to do. Beloved, it is about Jesus Christ explaining to your children what they're called to do. That becomes important. Teaching our children is what we are called to do. You see, God called us to do that. As parents, we must prioritize our thoughts and our intentions to instill godly wisdom. So we don't raise our children to do what we want them to do, what we think is best for them, but we raise our children to sense God, to know what God feels for them, and they should make a decision for God. Now, they may not make that decision right away, and we may have to pray as a parent, and intercessory prayer is very important, and we can pray for you Monday, Wednesday, or Friday if you join us on Facebook and YouTube. 
But I think it's important that we understand that God has given us the responsibility of training children because our children are God's people. And as we train them, that becomes important. We need to make sure they understand who God is so that when God speaks to them, they will make the right choices. God will speak to them. Sometimes as parents, we are called to speak to our children. And when we do, we must be very careful because God has certain aspects that he has required of our children. And we should say to them, okay, Lord, help me to talk to my child. Very important, beloved. We need to pay attention to that. So today we pray, Lord, help me to apply your word, the Bible, your word in all the areas of my life, even my parenting skill. I need to do that, Lord. Help me to do that today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Remember that because this is how you raise children. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and today we read Proverbs chapters 21 to 24. And you know, some have alleged that Proverbs chapter 23 verse 20 actually contradicts some other passages of Scripture regarding dietary laws. And the specific question is this, what kinds of animals are we allowed to eat? Some Bible passages say none, others say some, and still others say that we may eat all animals. So which is it? Well, let's take a close-up look at the passages in question. While many hold the Bible in very high esteem and accept its profession that it is God-breathed, others claim that it is foolish to trust its words because it's full of hundreds of errors and contradictions. While no such error or contradiction has yet been proven to the satisfaction of a court of law, still the allegations persist. One example of this has to do with the diet given to mankind by God. In particular, what kind of animals are we permitted to eat? According to Genesis 1.29, Proverbs 23.20, Daniel 1.8, and Romans 14.21, no animals may be eaten. But according to Deuteronomy 14.7-8, and Leviticus 11.2-4, only clean animals may be eaten. And according to Genesis 9.3, Mark 7.18-20, Luke 10.8, Acts 10.9-13, 10, 1 Corinthians 10.25, Romans 14.2, and 1 Timothy 4.1-3, all animals may be eaten. So then, which set of passages are correct? Actually, they all are. It is in fact the critic who has erred here because he or she has failed to distinguish between different times in history and failed to read the passages carefully. In regards to the timeline, God originally designed humans and animals to be vegetarian. At a later time, after the flood, God permitted people to eat the meat of any animal. Sometime after that, God placed additional restrictions on the kinds of meat that the Israelites were permitted to eat. This symbolically showed their separation as God's chosen people under the Old Testament administration before the coming of Christ. At a later time, when Christ came, God removed the dietary restrictions on the Israelites because the Old Testament administration had expired. It is also obvious that the critic has not read the passages very carefully, since some of them are completely irrelevant to the question which they posed, namely Proverbs 23.20 and Romans 14.2 and 21. Proverbs 23.20 is a warning against gluttony, and thus isn't speaking about the type of food we may eat, but rather the quantity thereof. And Romans 14.2 and 21 also doesn't place on us any dietary restrictions. Rather, it warns us to be mindful about what we do in front of others, lest it makes them stumble in their faith. Where then is there any error? Well, as you can see, there's absolutely no errors or contradictions between these passages whatsoever. The critic simply hasn't read the Bible carefully enough to realize that these passages represent different times in history. Now, also in regards to the food requirements listed in Deuteronomy 14, these were laws meant only for the Israelites under the Old Testament administration. 
And Proverbs 23.20, which was actually a part of our reading today, doesn't even make a statement regarding the type of food we're allowed to eat. It simply warns us of gluttony. So despite what critics say, the Bible can be trusted. And you know, I like how one pastor put it. He said that most people don't reject the Bible because they think it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts the way that they want to live. And that's the real heart of the issue. You know, it's true what the Bible says of itself in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that it is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Ouch. Corey, what are you studying today? Thanks, Ryan. Well, today our reading takes us all the way to Proverbs chapter 24. And then over the weekend, we're going to be finishing up the ancient book of Proverbs. But I wanted to focus instead uh, of, of on the Proverbs themselves, focusing in on what chapter 25 actually opens with. And that is, there's a, a, a superscript in there, a notation before we you really get into the chapter of Proverbs 25 that says that the following, Proverbs were actually collected during the reign of King Hezekiah by uh, his uh, office, his cabinet. He charged men with collecting more of the sayings of Solomon, the Proverbs of Solomon, and compiling them and adding them onto the book of Proverbs as they had them in that day. Uh, so today, you and I are going to be focusing in on King Hezekiah and his reign. He did a few really interesting things during his reign. One of them has to do with some of the symbolism and imagery that he chose to incorporate into his royal seal and the royal emblems and things of that nature. So let's take a look at this and then we'll talk about afterwards some of the significance for our Bible study today. It has been known for many years that Hezekiah, king of Judah, used royal imagery that was Egyptian in origin. But why Hezekiah chose this imagery and how he changed its meaning has been a matter of intense debate. The main symbol in question is the winged dung beetle, found on several signet seal impressions and representing at least two duplicate seals of the king. Another is the winged sun disc, found on storage jar handles and at least one signet seal of King Hezekiah. Depending on who is asked, there are three general answers. In the first, Hezekiah is directly borrowing from the Phoenicians who began appropriating Egyptian symbols like the rest of the ancient world early on in their history. This answer sees Hezekiah imposing reformed religious ideas onto the symbols. Scholars have pointed to Malachi 4 as an explanation. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. So then Hezekiah meant to represent the God of the Bible, bringing salvation to his nation. A second view believes that Hezekiah directly borrowed the symbols from Egypt, and instead of a religious significance, sees a political one in Hezekiah's image choice. In Egypt, the winged sun disk and scarab beetle were used to show the unity of Upper and Lower Egypt ruled over by the Pharaoh. So then Hezekiah chose this royal image to show his desire for a reunited kingdom of Israel as in the days of David and Solomon. Early in his reign, northern Israel had fallen to Assyria and was left kingless. Efforts on his part are recorded in the Bible to turn the people back to God, inviting even the kingless people of northern Israel to return to Yahweh worship under his rule. The third view thinks that the first two views are too speculative and reminds us that Egyptian imagery was widespread in the ancient world, so it's entirely possible that no meaning was attached to the winged sun and beetle, other than its memory as a powerful royal symbol. Despite that, it is interesting that after Hezekiah, these royal images were retired in Judah, a result of the religious reforms of Josiah, or perhaps more likely, the result of Judah switching allegiances from Egypt to Babylon. So I find it really interesting that in light of all of this, in light of uh, of what it appears that Hezekiah was trying to accomplish during his reign, the, the reunification of Israel and Judah, ushering in a time uh, like that, that harkens back to the time period of David and Solomon, it's really interesting and fitting that in Proverbs 25, we learn that it was Hezekiah's court. It was his government structure that he tasked with this um, uh, 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 
mission to gather more of King Solomon's ancient Proverbs and, and put them into a biblical format and attach them to the book of Proverbs that they already had. So it, it just goes right in line with what King Hezekiah was all about ushering in a time of spiritual wisdom, a time of uh, uh, power and strength for the Israelites. And, and, and unfortunately, it, it ended up being more of a mixture of God's plan with Hezekiah's plan, fortunately and unfortunately. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to keep in mind as we continue to read through the Proverbs. You know, Corey, it's interesting because when you, when you begin to study Hezekiah and begin to read about what he did and the revival that he had and all of that, uh, of course, Hezekiah ends the last 15 years of his life is a gift from God. And he says, God tells him, I'm going, you know, you better get yourself together because you're going to die. And Hezekiah took, looks to the wall and begins to weep and God grants him 15 more years. But Hezekiah and, and what they did uh, was absolutely astounding. And this is what we are benefiting from, Corey, what you've talked about. And he really worked hard to return the worship of God in Jerusalem. And in fact, he sent people around to uh, the rest of Israel mm -hmm. outside of Judah to bring back uh, worship to God if they wanted to come. Some people laughed at him mm -hmm. and many people came from various tribes. And it's really interesting because as you begin to study that core and you begin to learn about that, uh, it's kind of a revival. And the further that, that he came from David, the more distant David's practices were. So that's really interesting. And uh, when you did that, or when you put that together, what else did you learn about Hezekiah, Corey? Uh, just really how tenacious he seems to have been, uh, you know, coming out of a time period, his father was, uh, was really bad in terms of how, you know, kings go. They were living in this time of, uh, of threat. There was great threat with the, the Assyrian Empire and his dad had, you know, tried to make peace with the Assyrian Empire and had gone in the opposite direction. He had uh, brought pagan practices into the temple in Jerusalem and just sold him he had gone all in on the plan to go totally pagan and see if that would bring prosperity back to Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, and so Hezekiah being raised under that, I think it's tremendously interesting then that he listens to the prophet Isaiah and tenaciously goes after this vision, this dream of uh, reunifying Israel and Judah to uh, withstand the Assyrian Empire and, and really turn back the clock and, and worship God the way he was supposed to be worshipped. He trying to usher in this time where people again uh, look to the spiritual wisdom that was gathered in, in the Proverbs that was gathered at this time of Solomon. So this tenacity of Hezekiah is something that it's really easy to miss as if you're just reading through the scriptures really quickly. But there, there are so many uh, pieces of this Hezekiah puzzle, and we're going to continue to read about him when we get into the prophet Isaiah. There's so many pieces to this puzzle that just add up to, wow, Hezekiah was a really tenacious guy. And it, it always makes me think about how this must have been an exciting time for the prophet Isaiah. I can tell you that, that uh, you know, it, it really is. And when we read about it, it's three times in Scripture. And when we really read about it, uh, we understand that it's in the historical book, the chronology. And then, of course, it's in Isaiah. And uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And remember that, uh, you know, Hezekiah was, was just tenacious. He was that way. And that's one of the reasons why he cries to God and says, I'm not going to die, you know, don't make me die. And God says, well, okay. God knew the character and he knew the way that Hezekiah was. And I find that absolutely fascinating. I also love the fact that when he was confronted with Sennacherib's threat, yes. he just took the letter and Put it marched right Lord. into the house of the Lord and, and laid it before the Lord and said, look and see what's being said. Because he was, he was trying to explain that it wasn't him. And, and he says, maybe Lord, you have heard what Rebecca said about mm -hmm. you. Maybe you have heard that. And of course God heard it, but mm -hmm. that's what he said. And uh, it's really fascinating. The only other revival like this 
is one of the greatest revivals of all times in ancient Israel, and that's Josiah's revival. Mm -hmm. And Josiah came after Manasseh and Amnon, mm -hmm. and Josiah took over, and he really went crazy, and he said, you know, we're going to do this. And I mean, it was something else. So it's fascinating. It really is. And then when you get to Ezra, that's a whole other story. But Anyway, we're running out of time, so let's get to the question. Go All ahead. right, so here we are. I hope you've read Proverbs 22 at home. And uh, I know that uh, Marinette and Sinclair, they answer the questions and probably right every time on Friday, just so you know. Sinclair is great. Uh, they both so are, Marinette. Marinette and Sinclair, excellent. And I know Diane in Quebec, she answers the questions all the time. So here you go, Ryan and Corey. According to Proverbs 22, what is to be chosen rather than great riches. According to Proverbs 22, what is to be chosen rather than great riches? Here are your three options. A good harvest, a good and true companion, or a good name. Which one of those three? According to Proverbs 22. What think you? <laughs> well, I think it's a third one. I think it's a good name. How about you, Ryan? What do you think? That, you know what? That sounds like the right answer. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> well, I'm going to read it to you from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1. It starts right off the top. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. Good job, everybody. That's right. And remember that we, of course, next time on Quick Study Television, we're talking about a number of things. One of the things we're going to talk about on the weekend, of course, is the fool. And we'll talk about him and who is he and what does that mean and how does the Bible deal with that. But also remember that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is our prayer time. And so we come at 3 o'clock Eastern, five or, uh, 3 o'clock Eastern, and 12 o'clock California, 5 o'clock English time. And that's as far as I can go <laughs> right now. Facebook and YouTube. Facebook and YouTube.